Good morning and happy Sabbath. <clears throat> it is exciting to be here, to see everyone here, and those of you watching online, we'd like to welcome you as well. So we're starting a new sermon series, a seven-part series this day, today, this Sabbath. Guess what it's called? It's called Relationship Status. Are you cheating? Oh, yeah, it's on the screen here. <laughs> relationship Status. We are about to embark on a journey to learn about relationships. Now, you might be wondering why. Why in the world are we talking? We're going to spend seven weeks talking about relationships. Well, let me, tell, let me share with you at least two reasons. Number one, it's what everyone thinks about. Okay? Everyone, every day, thinks about relationships. That's first. Secondly, when we did our last sermon series, Your Questions Answered, questions about relationship were the, the most frequently asked questions in our survey out of the 50, 60 questions that we got. And we were thinking as a pastoral staff, what is our, our church, our, our people, our viewers thinking? And so we're going to launch right into this sermon series today entitled Relationship Status. If you, don't, if you, don't, if you didn't already get a, a flyer, they, they should have some extra flyers. If we ran out, we're going to print some more. This is not just for ourselves. This is for your neighbor, your friend, maybe your, even your enemy. We come to church not to just be a consumers, but to contribute, right? To invite others to experience the joy of sharing Jesus. And so I've been sharing this with other, other people. Let's share this good news. And if we ran out of these, um, we'll, we'll, we'll print some more. We're going to print some more uh, this week. But today, you know what the topic is entitled? Single with a purpose. We're going to talk about singleness. Next week, we'll be dating. Week after that, newlyweds. We're going to cover sexuality, parenting, to end or not to end. We're going to close with marriage for the long haul, October 29th. But today, single with a purpose. Single with a purpose. So the message today is primarily for those who are single. And maybe those who are single and really excited about mingling. Single and ready to mingle. This message may even be for those who are single, uh, single widows. But just in case you're married or in your, you're in a special relationship and you think, ah, you know, I, I should just leave here because this message is not for me, I would beg to differ. This message is especially important and vital for those who are married. I would even say this, and we'll explain this later on in the, the, the teaching, that God wants us to be single in our marriages, now, that's a loaded statement. We're going to unpack that. But singleness is an important concept, and we're going to talk about that in today's teaching. Let me just put a picture on the screen here uh, to start off our, our, our message and our talk. So the picture of me, I don't know if you can see that picture. Do you see who is in, the, in a yellow shirt? <laughs> that's me, all right? That is me, and that's my daughter, Eliana. Eliana, do you remember this? This was this past summer. We were at Camp Akita. Camp Akita is a camp which is part of our community, of our larger community of faith. And I was there as the camp pastor for a week. And one of the activities we did was archery. And so here's a picture of me trying to teach my daughter how to shoot a bow and arrow. I wasn't very good because I don't know how, <laughs> but I was trying to teach her. I had the privilege later on of shooting my own bow and uh, my own arrow and so I remember <clears throat> grabbing that bow, and uh, I remember they gave me a wooden bow, and a wood, uh, wooden bow, I, I, I grabbed this arrow, and I remember shooting it, first shot, completely missed the target. Second shot, completely missed the target. After a few times, I was starting to hit the target, I didn't get the bullseye, but I got closer to the target. I remember one time, the second time around, when I shot, I was so proud of myself. Like, I'm so good at this, right? The, the arrow uh, uh, pierced, or didn't pierce, but flew through this space between the net and the roof, went out all the way into the field and into the pond. Like, what am I doing? Now, there were a couple times where I, I felt good about myself because I hit this floating target, but it was a big target. What's the point? Why talk about archery? It's like, it's, it's, it's because of this. Where you aim in life matters. Where you and I aim in life matters. 
and my worry, especially for those who are single, is we have no aim to our lives. What's the aim? One writer said this, if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. If you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. And my worry, um, uh, uh, my worry is that those of us, those among us who are single, we have no aim. What is the main aim of my life? Is it to get married? Is it to be dating? Is it to be in a relationship? I can't stop thinking about this boy. I can't stop thinking about this girl. What is the, 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 the primary aim and target of life? And so this morning, we're going to cover four points. Four points. So number one and two. We're going to learn what our main target is not, so two wrong goals, so number, we're going to learn about the first wrong target, we're going to learn about the second wrong target, and then when we get to point three, we're going to learn what our main target is, and then lastly, number four, we're going to learn how we can aim at the right target, all right? So we're going to learn about two wrong targets, what the right target is, and we're going to learn how to aim at the right target, and we're going to go to the book the letter of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So if you have a Bible, if you have a digital Bible, that's okay. Let's go there. You have to see this with your own eyes. Why this passage? Because out of all of the passages in, in Scripture, this one addresses singleness the most. And it's the one, there was one verse in this text that someone in our congregation asked. It was actually this text, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Verses six and seven. I say this as a concession, not as a command. Look at the verse seven. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Verse eight. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. And so this was evidence said, hey, so pastoral team, uh, this is evidence. See, Paul says that he wishes that people were single like him. So therefore, singleness must be better than marriage, Right? So that's, that's why we're covering this passage. So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to start with verse 1, and we're going to find out first, what is the wrong target? So here is Paul speaking, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. I'm in the New International Version. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. What's going on here? The church in Corinth was newly formed and they're wondering, how do we live out Christian principle in a pagan culture? And so they're writing letters and they're asking Paul, hey, you're the apostle, you're the spiritual guide and leader, please tell us, give us some advice. And so they were talking about sexuality. Notice what he says here in verse two. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Verse 5, do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. What is going on here? Look what he says in verse 6. I say this as a concession, not as a command. There is... This idea that sexuality is a dirty, horrible thing is not in the scriptures. Paul is saying, look, the, the, the early believers in verse one, they're saying, hey, it's good for a man not to have relations with a woman. Paul is saying, no, 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 no. Don't deprive each other. It's a beautiful thing. And by the way, today we're not talking about this topic in detail. We're going to learn more about this when I bring our guest, when we bring our guest speaker, Dr. Sedlacek, on October 8th. So circle that in your calendar. You're not going to want to miss that day when he's going to unpack this in more detail. But what he's saying here is that it's a beautiful thing. Now, there are some times where you have to take a pause because you have to pray. That's okay. But don't deprive each other. So that's the context. Then he says in verse 6, I say this as a concession, not as a command. Meaning, this is not a biblical mandate. This is a biblical principle. Okay, this is not a command from the Lord. This is what I believe for myself and what I think is a good principle. And in context of what he just said, he says this in verse 7. I wish that all of you were as I am. 
but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Some, some have the gift of marriage. Some don't have the gift of marriage. Some have the gift of singleness. But notice what he says in verse 9, guys. Look at this. Or verse 8. Now to the unmarried and the widows I say, so that the singles and those who, who were married but are single because they had a, 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 a spouse who passed away, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. And then he says this in verse 9. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. What do you mean by this, Paul? But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Paul, come on. Are you saying that marriage is for the weak? That the young man, the young woman, that the man or woman who can't control these raging desires in their heart that burns with passion, that that, that person should do the weaker thing and get married? Paul, come on. Are you denigrating marriage and saying that and elevating singleness and saying that singleness is better than marriage? I don't think so. I don't believe that Paul (coughs) is trying to denigrate or lower marriage. Marriage is not for the weak. No, 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 no. Paul actually has a high view of marriage. You read about it in Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands and wives love each other, submit to each other, love each other. So what is he talking about here? What is he talking about? What does he mean by this phrase? The New International Version says this phrase uh, in the last part of verse 9. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. What does the word or the phrase burn with passion mean? What Paul is referring to based on the context He's referring to those who are sexually immoral. In fact, look at, look at this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, he says four words. Flee from sexual immorality. All right? Do you know what the Greek word for sexual immorality is? Porneia, by which we get the, the, the term pornography. So he says, when we... This, this burning with passion that's having these experiences outside of the beautiful boundaries of a committed relationship between a man and a woman. Sexual immorality is anything, any activity outside of the beautiful boundaries of a covenant relationship between a man and a woman prior to the marriage experience or even during the mar- marriage experience. Having uh, these, these experiences with another individual or even a fake individual on a screen. This is what he means. And he's saying this, especially to a culture in Corinth where prostitution was a normal thing of society, a normal right of society. It was in their religious rights, in their worship. It was part of their civic duty in some cases, that if I want to be a good citizen, that I have to go to these temples and, and experience sexual, sexual immorality, it was part of that culture. And Paul's saying, hey, 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 believers, believers, listen, you who are in this pagan context, please be obedient. Enjoy the beauty of sexuality and physical intimacy within the boundaries of marriage, of, 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 of a, a husband and wife relationship. Don't participate in prostitution and what the rest of the culture is doing because it actually mars the image of God and, and messes up that, that, that beautiful experience that God wants you to experience. That's what he's saying to the, the, to the believers. So then, come on, Paul. So then what do you mean by that? What do you mean by saying that I have a gift? That I have a gift. <laughs> he says in verse seven, I wish that all of you were as I am, single, but each of you has your own gift. What does he mean? What does he mean by singleness? Does he mean that it's better to be single than to be married? Here's what I believe based on the the context. Please listen. Paul is not trying to elevate singleness above marriage. What he is trying to say is this. He says, I am single, yes, but more importantly, I am celibate in the sense that my life, unlike the pagans, is not ruled by sexual satisfaction. He says, I have a gift that even though I am a man, 
my life is not ruled by this satisfaction. Some people don't have that same impulse or that same control. He realizes that. And with the commentaries I've read, Gordon Fee, commentator on 1 Corinthians, they all agree that he's not talking about just being single. He's talking about having the gift of not being ruled by the passions. Pastor, what in the world does this have to do with singleness? What are you talking about here? Let me break this down. In our culture, there are at least four views of, we're going to call it physical intimacy. Okay? Here's the first view. Number one, physical intimacy is natural. This came from the ancient Greeks and Romans. It's probably the view of the believers during, in, the, in the city of Corinth. And the view was, the view was this. Physical intimacy, sexual, sexual intimacy, it's natural. It's biological. Go ahead and do it, it's, but just be responsible. It's a natural thing, right? So that's the first view. Second view. Intimacy is, physical intimacy is a dirty thing. Where does this idea come from? It comes from, the, from ancient Greek thought, a few hundred years even before Christ was here, where the Greeks believed that that the mind, that the spirit was pure and holy and good, and that the body was carnal and dirty and bad. And physical intimacy and sexuality is a bad thing because that relates relates to the, that's everything, that relates to the body. And by the way, friends, I'm gonna speak to believers here. This idea that we think that uh, sexuality is a dirty thing that we shouldn't talk about, it actually links back to over 2,000 years to Greek, Roman, to, to Greek thought. This idea that it's a dirty, horrible thing. Right? So that's the second view. Here's the third view, which, which is the view that we're living in right now in our culture. That intim- physical intimacy is self-realization. Around the 1800s in the Romantic period, between 1800 to 1850, we had uh, this, this turn to reason where Happiness, my happiness and my pleasure and my my delight is primary. And so physical intimacy is just a way of self-realization or actually becoming who I was designed to be. And so whether or not I'm in a committed relationship with an individual, I should express myself. Okay? Fourth view, and this is the view that Paul had and the view that we can have, the biblical view, which is intimacy is self-giving, not self-realization, but self-giving, meaning that intimacy is, not, is, is natural, but it needs boundaries, right? Secondly, this idea that intimacy is dirty, no, it's the most beautiful thing as long as you're in a committed relationship. This third view, which we're living in in our culture today, that intimacy is self-realization, yes, intimacy yields amazing uh, pleasure and happiness within the, the boundaries of commitment. What is the biblical view? And what was the view that Paul was trying to teach the church in Corinth in this pagan, sexualized culture? He was saying that intimacy is not about self-realization or just your happiness. Intimacy is about self-giving. Physical intimacy is not primarily about my happiness. Physical intimacy is about the happiness of my spouse who I am in a committed covenantal relationship with. It is a joyful experience in the context of a covenant, of a covenant. So what's Paul's point here? Paul's point is this, that the first wrong target is sexual fulfillment. The first wrong target is is sexual fulfillment, meaning that, that, um, our main target in life is not sexual fulfillment. And unfortunately, our culture has idolized that, and it's all over, in the, it's, it's everywhere in the arts, in the movies, in the music, in the things that we consume. That that's, that's what we need, just happiness, 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 pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. No, the main target is not sexual fulfillment. Come on, Paul, what else do you have to say? Here's a second, here's a second wrong target. Verses 25 through 28. Stay with me. 
1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 25 through 28. Here we go. Now about virgins. I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Here he goes again. This is not a command. This is a principle. Verse 26. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Verse 27. Are you pledged to a woman? Do you not seek to be released? Uh, do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. Verse 28, but if you do marry, you have not sinned. Thank you, by the way, Paul, for saying that if I'm married, I'm not sinning. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But notice what he says. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> those who get married are going to have many troubles? Come on, Paul. Are you saying that marriage is a bad thing? I mean, didn't God put put Adam and Eve together? I mean, isn't it a beautiful thing? Are you saying it's a bad thing? I don't think he's saying it's a bad thing. You know why? Because he says this in the next verse, verses 29 through 31. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that time is short. That's what he's saying. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. And then notice what he says. For this world in its present form is passing away. What's his point? (laughs) He's saying that there is a higher purpose to live for other than marriage. He believed, Paul believed, that because Jesus had come and right after his resurrection, that right after Jesus left, that was beginning of the time of the end. That the end was coming. I mean, you can see it in his writings. All right, Paul, what do you you mean by that? Hey, because Jesus is in heaven and he's asking us to be ambassadors in this pagan world, to be witnesses and to, and to reach people and to spread and to, to grow the kingdom of God. Because of that purpose, that primary purpose, he says, those of you who are married should live as if they are not married. He's saying in light of the end, in light of this grander purpose of being part of God's kingdom, don't idolize marriage. Now, as you see, marriage is not, Paul is not saying that marriage is bad. Marriage is great. It's the most, it's, it's, it's an institution that was created by God, and it's the, the most intimate experience that any man and woman can experience in this world. Marriage is wonderful and amazing, but it is not the chief goal. Paul is saying to the believers, and he's saying to us today, do not make marriage an idol. Don't make sexual fulfillment an idol. That's the wrong target. I don't want to point at people here, but. Don't make marriage an idol. That's not the primary target. Neither should you make singleness the, art, the, the, the primary goal of your life. That's not the right target. And he's saying to us today, do not make marriage an idol. You know, I was just uh, having a conversation with some, some uh, Gen Z millennials Young adults, right? Just, just here a couple before we started the worship service. And there's this prevalent idea, especially in our culture, that marriage is God's ultimate goal for all people. Why is that? You look at every culture, you look at like, um, you know, Bollywood or Korea soap, Korean soap operas, right? K-dra- K-drama. <laughs> you look at every single culture, everyone, everyone uh, romanticizes marriage and being in a relationship because that is the primary goal and the chief target of life to be in a romantic relationship and we see it even within our culture how do i know that because we love playing matchmaker okay i'm not going to ask you to raise your hand but raise but in your mind raise your hand if you've ever been tried to play the, the role of cupid oh yeah 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 hey you should join the church choir or you should go to church to this really handsome, godly man who has a good job. Right? Oh, you're still single, man? You're 32 years old? You're still single? Oh. You know what we're doing, you know what we're doing when we say that? We're saying that the supreme goal of life is marriage. And until you find that, then you're never going to be happy. And Paul says, 
Hey, believers, stop it. Culture, stop it. Marriage, romance is not the primary target of life. Paul doesn't idolize sexual fulfillment. He doesn't idolize marriage. Neither does he idolize singleness. I like what one writer, Stanley Haverbos, he said this. One of the few clear differences between Christianity and Judaism is the former's entertainment of the idea of singleness as the paradigm way of life for its followers. When Christianity came on the scene, Christianity uh, elevated singleness. Singleness was legitimate. Not because sex was thought to be a particularly questionable activity, but because the mission of the church was such that between the times, between the times of Jesus and his coming again, the church required those who were capable of complete service to the kingdom. What does this mean? This means that my choice between singleness and marriage is not based upon my happiness. My choice between singleness and marriage is what will make me most useful for the kingdom of God. Just in case you missed that. What Paul is saying, and what I believe God is telling us, is that the primary target of life has nothing to do with marriage. My singleness, my choice between singleness and marriage is not due, is not based upon my happiness. Oh, you know, everyone tells me that I'm gonna be I'm gonna be so sad for the rest of my life if I don't get married, or I look at Instagram and I see all of my friends <laughs> in relationships. Uh, no, Paul is saying. That, the, that I don't make a decision between singleness and marriage based on my happiness. I do it with this filter, asking the question, will singleness or marriage help me to be more useful to expand the kingdom of God? Come on, Paul. Speaking to us in this culture that has idolized sexual satisfaction and that has idolized marriage. Our primary target is not sexual satisfaction. Our primary target is not marriage. That's the second wrong target. So then, what is the right target? Number three, verses 32 to 35. Notice what Paul says. Don't miss this, friends. Don't miss. You gotta see it with your own eyes if you have a Bible. 1 Corinthians 7, 32 to 35. I would like you to be free from concern. <clears throat> An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world and how he can please his wife, 34, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. You see what he's saying? He's saying, he's saying you know, marriage is not a bad thing. <laughs> but if you're married, you're, you're, you're constantly thinking about temporal matters instead of eternal matters solely. Then he says this in 35. Please listen. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. What was that word before devotion? Undivided. I don't like the trans, how, they trans, how the New International Version translated that word undivided. Do you know what it is in the Greek? This word only shows once in all of the New Testament and it's in this verse. That word in the Greek means without distraction. What is he saying here? <clears throat> Whether we are single or married, our chief goal in life is to have an undistracted view of God. That's the chief goal of life. That I'm not going to worry about the butterflies or the birds or the people talking when I'm shooting my bow and arrow. No, 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 no. I'm not going to worry about the noise. Hey, get married. No, no, no. I'm not going to worry about that. Hey, satisfy your, your these desires. No, 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 no. My main target in life is to have an undistracted view of God. My main target in life is not just to fulfill these desires inside of me. My main target in life is not marriage. My main target in life is God. That is my main target. Paul does not idolize fulfillment, he doesn't idolize singleness, he doesn't idolize marriage. He, he says our main goal is God and here's why it matters. Here's why it matters, guys. If my aim is wrong, I'm never going to hit the bullseye. And let me just be real here. The content from the scripture that I'm 
reading and teaching today is information that I wish I had when I was a teenager. Or at least I had it, but lived by it. And I'm going to tell you right now, it would have saved me a lot of headache and heartache. It would have saved me headache and heartache. Because if when my aim was wrong, I never hit the bullseye. And when our aim is, you know, all over the place, I don't know what really my, my, you know, my goal in life is. Yeah, 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 you know, you know, I should be in a relationship because that's what people tell me to, they tell me to do. Right? That's, if other people are telling us what the tar, where the bullseye is and they're not really at the bullseye, we're never going to hit the target. But if my aim, my primary aim in life, my main target, if, my, if I have the right aim and my aim is God, I'll hit the bullseye. And it's not like that bullseye is uh, uh, coming to Jesus is, is a burden. No, 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 no. It's the most beautiful experience to know that whether or not, whether or not I'm married, that whether I'm single or I'm married, that I can be fulfilled in him. So the primary target is not fulfillment. Primary target is not marriage. The chief target and primary target in life is God. Last but not least, how can we make sure that we're aimed at the right target? And I'll take it from two sections and then we're done. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 25. He says this. Now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy, what word did I say? One who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. In other words, Paul is saying, you can trust what I say, not because I make appeal to my own authority, but I make an appeal to the mercy of God. That's my only authority. That is only by the grace of God that I have any authority to tell you what I'm saying. All right, Pastor, break that down a little bit more. How is that applicable to me? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 19 and 20. You can't miss this, guys. You have to see this, friends. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Verse 20. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You were bought at a price. Which is to say this, that here's a question for you. What was God's target? What was Christ's target? Christ's target was you. Christ's target was me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, God so loves that he gave, that he bought us at a price, and he didn't pay a billion dollars. He paid with his own life. He spilled blood and bought us at a price to win us back, to restore our relationship with the Father. Which is to say this, that the primary object of his affections is you. That I am his target. Our primary target is not fulfillment. Neither is it marriage. It's God. But the only way that I can keep my eyes focused on him and have an undistracted view of my target is not by trying to tell myself to work harder. No, it is to remember and to believe and to receive the fact that God has died for me and that I am a target, the target of his affections, the primary target of his affections. That he will pour out all of heaven and he will take all the arrows and die for the sake of saving us. And the more I receive and believe and cherish that and remember what Christ has done and forsake sin and selfishness and say, I want all of the Savior in my life. I want that. I want Christ, the one who took an arrow for me in his heart. When I receive that, that's what keeps, that is the only thing, the primary thing that keeps my eye fixed on God as my primary target. 
Our praise team is gonna come up. And I wanna share this. <clears throat> we have this connect card. And we have this, it's in the pew in front of you, we even have a QR code. <laughs> Every week, we believe that the Spirit of God works in the lives and hearts of people who listen to the gospel, listen to the word. <laughs> and my appeal is simple. No, grow, and go. Number one, no. If you've never known Christ and you've never been baptized or maybe you have been baptized but you've been separated from God and you're thinking, I want to get re-baptized, I want to get baptized again, and you want to know God, I would say fill out baptism on the Connect card, even online. <laughs> All right? So knowing God through baptism. Number two, Grow. I am, in part, I'm in, I am in several small groups and I realize that the only way that, the best way that I can grow is to be part of a Bible study group of a smaller intimate circle, a part of a community where I can grow with other like-minded believers. And if, you're, if you and your heart are saying, I wanna be part of a group like that, a small group where we learn the Bible together and experience fellowship and be part of a community, then mark that on your connect card. That's grow. So know through baptism, grow, being part of a, a Bible study community, and last but not least, go. Know, grow, go. We're not just here, friends, as consumers of, consumers of religion. No, 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 no. God has called every believer to be a contributor. And you're saying, you know what? I'm tired of just sitting, sitting, by the, sitting on the sidelines, and I want to be a contributor right on the field. Right on the field. I want to be engaged and make a commitment to serve on a ministry or to serve in a small group or to be, to be used by God rather than to just sit and to consume, but I want to be used by God and engaged to do something. Mark, serving on a ministry team. That's how you can go with him. Know through baptism. Grow in a, a small group community. Go for him on a ministry team. Mark that. And as our praise team leads us in our, 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 uh, our closing song here, I want to encourage you, friends, to submit that, that uh connect card in the, the uh, offering plates as our deacons come through as we sing this song and as they collect our tithes and offerings and as we sing this song could we say God out of response for your great love for me because you've targeted me as your, the greatest object of your affections could I, I want to respond to you and serve you and love you and trust you let's respond to Jesus today Let's stand together as we sing this closing song, The Goodness of God.